How many glad still glad to be in church? Okay, that's good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Me too. <clears throat> Amen. I was thinking this week, I was going over some things. Do you ever have a week where everything seems to attack you at once? And uh, huh? How many has ever had a week like that? Just me? Okay. The rest, the rest of you, do you live life? <laughs> but I, I had one of those weeks, and it's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating on a word, I'm concentrating on what God wants to bring, and just all these interruptions and distractions and so on and so forth. And uh, I was complaining a little bit, and I was grumbling in my prayer time, and I said, you know, I, I just need to get alone, I need quiet, I need to get with the Lord, and just get His presence, and it just wouldn't, wouldn't happen. Mm-hmm. And uh, God showed me something, and, and, um, and <laughs> he said, he says, uh, this is preparation. He said, in other words, he says, he says, we're in a season of change, and basically this is preparation. You're not always going to have the luxury of receiving the word the way you want it received or the way you think you've, you've done it for all these years or whatever. And it, it showed me something. It showed me that no matter how old we get or how many years we've been doing what we're doing, the fact is God is still fresh and new, and he's d- doing different things. Uh, you know, and, and there's just challenging things. I've had uh, uh, people uh, that we've ministered to and stuff in the church, and I was sharing this with leadership this morning in the war room, and I, I says, you know, and, and, well, some people just give you a hard time. Some people do this. How many ever had that on their jobs where people give you a hard time? And, and, and you think, well, this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong, and, 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 and I, could, I could fix this if they just listen to me, and, and so on and so forth. And I heard God say, well, it's not about them, it's about you. Sure. Amen? Because basically what God is doing, he's, how, how do you think we're going to get trained for the things of God? By having it easy, comfort zone or whatever. There's a, there's a strength that's needed. Now, the title of my message this morning is The Strength in the Last Mile. There's a strength that's needed this morning that you're not going to get from the world. You're not going to get it from social media. You're not even going to get it from your best friend to pat you on the back, say, hey, you're doing a good job, keep on going, which is encouraging. But there's going to be a strength needed that is discussed in the scriptures that we need to tap into. I want to, so I want to share some scriptures this morning. But I'm going to talk about strength this morning and getting our strength. Uh, I don't know where you stand in your eschatology, but I, I personally believe that we are in the last of the last days. I really do. Uh, I see things happening in the world, but that's not what I look at. I used to. I used to look at the things that well, China and Russia and this and that and Magog. You know, I used to probably put all together in the scriptures. And, and I, I realized what I'm doing, I'm looking at what the devil's doing to try to figure out what God wants to do and has already planned to do. And I said, no, that, that, that's backwards. I said, I, I don't need to do that. What I need to do is ask God, where should we be at? <laughs> and ask him because it's his plan. The devil doesn't know, and the devil's kids don't know. The fact is, is God is revealing, he's revealing to his church. Remember my pastor years ago, he said this thing, it, was, it just stuck with me. He says, if you want to see Jesus move in the last days, he says, you better be in church. He said, the reason he said that with the book of Revelation, it said that Jesus moved in the midst of the candlesticks. And if you don't understand the scripture about the candlesticks, he's talking about the churches. There were seven churches in Asia Minor. And Jesus was moving between the candlesticks, and the candlesticks were those churches. And that's where he got it from. He said, Jesus wants to move to his churches. Amen? And change and transform. Well, how many know that when we come into the presence of God, he's going to challenge some of the things that we are or what we're not? Why? Because if he doesn't challenge those things, we can't change. And he's bringing new life. So we're going to get things that aren't so comfortable sometimes, even in, done just in life. But sometimes in, in, in the scriptures and when God speaks to us, may not be all comfortable all the time. But what he's trying to do, he's trying to bring us to a place and grow us up. And that's all I want to kind of talk about this morning. Is we okay? Amen. Praise the Lord. Good, they got some water in my pulpit. Thank you, Jesus. If you turn in your Bible, <clears throat> whatever kind you have, this is the old-fashioned analog, still works, don't need an on and off switch. Praise the Lord. Or you got the new modern one. I'm going to, my first scripture I'm going to read this morning is Philippians 3.13. This is one of my favorites, but one of my favorites for years. And Paul writes the book of Philippians. You may not know this, but understand before we read this book how it was written. It was written while Paul was still in prison. Now, 
Paul was in prison. He really never got out of prison once he was imprisoned. He was killed uh, uh, after that, but he, he wrote uh, almost as many epistles in the prison as he did outside the prison. So when I read this this morning, understand something about Paul. He had already lived some life. He had already done some things. He wasn't speaking as a, a, a new convert. He wasn't speaking as just somebody who started out of the ministry. He was talking about somebody who had some years under his belt, and he had seen shipwrecks, uh, imprisonment, beatings, and everything else. Now let's read the scripture. <clears throat> 313, verse 13 says, Brethren, I do not count myself as, as, as to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Verse 14 I press, that word press means to pursue or to drive away. It means to dr press in or pursue. Toward the goal, there is a goal, and the, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Hmm. There is a, there's a prize and there's an upward call. He says, I don't, I'm not talking as one who's apprehended that yet. Though I've got some experiences, well, I kind of read between the lines. I've got some experiences. This one, one thing I know for sure. Forgetting those things which are behind, which would indicate to me the things that we have behind are the things that are holding us back from going forward. And we retain these things, whether in our minds, our hearts, or whatever. Amen? A lot of times we, we blame the way we were raised. Okay, maybe some of you didn't come from a good household, and you blame your future for your raised. He's saying, no, forget those things. Forget those things, and let's launch forward. Because God has a different plan. If we continually look back at the hurts and the wounds, we'll never see the plan God has for us because he's not living there. He's living in the future. Praise the Lord. I, I, I picked this up. Can I read this out of, just listen, I'll, I'll read this out of the Passion Translation. It says a little bit differently. Look, again, Philippians 3, 13, 14 out of the Passion Bible. It says this. It says, I do not depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past as I have fastened my heart to the future instead. I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. I thought that was pretty good. Amen? Pressing forward keeps us from focusing. Or pressing forward keeps us from focusing on the seen to be able to recognize the unseen. Can I say that again? Okay, the pre pressing forward, what it does, it keeps us from focusing our focus and our attention on what's seen right here, okay, to what is not seen, which is the promise that he's given us. Amen? Amen. So that's what we're talking about this morning. Okay, this morning, this is the, this is the direction I want to go. I, I, I threw this in because I thought this was kind of kind of neat for, for this context, but it said Romans chapter 3, th uh, verse 23, you know this one very well. Uh, but it says, it says, for all have sinned and, and fallen short of the glory. Now, this is what we use for, for we need salvation. Can, can, I, can I use it in a different light this morning? Uh, read it again. We all, have fallen, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. That would indicate to me that the glory is the target. The, the target, the prize that Paul is talking about is the glory of God. So what are we talking about the glory of God? We're talking about the honor of God. We're talking about, uh, uh, well, I took it out of the Greek, right, this particular uh, word uh, translated from the Greek, and it means dignity and majesty. We're pressing towards a recognition of the dignity and majesty of the Lord, Amen. and that's the prize we have. When we do that, we are enveloped with his presence. We're enveloped with the things he wants to give us, and automatically what happens and comes to us comes encouragement and strength. Are we here this morning? Praise the Lord. Amen. That's pretty good. Now, I, I, I want to get what I want to do. I want to get into some, some things that are hindrances, stumbling blocks, uh, some things that we can overcome, some of, the, some of the things that the enemy wants to do to try to hold us back. And I want to cover them this morning. Okay? Are we all right? All right. So I'm going to give you a few scriptures and I'll, I'll back and discuss them. Last, uh, our last session, I talked about, I, I've sh shared this scripture a lot in Matthew chapter 14. Shared the scripture about Jesus walking on the water. Remember that? And I gave you a, a kind of revelation of that. Let me go ahead and read the scripture. If you weren't here last week, I'll go ahead and re read the scripture again. It says, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled and said, it is a ghost. 
for they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke and said unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Verse 28 says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be you, command me to come uh, to you under the waters. And so he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked in the water, he went to, to, to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind and the, the, it was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink and cry out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him, and said, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. Because a couple of things, that, for one thing, I don't know about you, but if I walked three foot on the top of the water, now I'm on the ocean quite a bit. I, my wife and I are avid scuba divers, so I'm out there all the time. I've never walked in water. I would say that was that's beyond. In other words, that's a would be even uh, supersedes the laws of physics. Water is not something we walk on. I have been pulled behind the boat with water skis and skied across the water with a forward momentum, but I have never got out on my own and walked across the water. The closest I come to every time I go on a dive boat I, it's called the giant stride. It's going from the boat and entering into the water, and you put one foot out, and you go like this with your hand, and, and the other fin comes back like this, and basically you, you do a, a graceful giant stride, but you never walk on the water. If I had to walk three feet, I'd be so proud of myself because I heard from God and it was successful. But that was not the response of Jesus. This is what I shared with you last week, that revelation last week. It was not the response. He said, oh, ye little faith. Because Jesus wasn't looking for Peter to walk a little ways. He was looking for him to walk the entire way. Remember what it says, in what Jesus said a couple of times in the scriptures. He said, it's not how you, it, it, basically he who endures to the end shall be saved. God is looking for the end game more than he's looking at the beginning. The, the, the devil wants to bring you up about your past, and he wants to keep you there focused on that. Well, I can never do that. You know, it's, it's just not me. What is you? Are you looking at the you that you used to be, or are you looking at the you that's a new creation that you haven't even discovered yet? Well, none of us have. We're still discovering it. It'll probably take eternity to discover all of what we are. So to say I'm this way or that way... You're talking about habits you have developed over the years, but are we talking about what God sees in us? He's not interested in your habits. He's interested in you <laughs> and me, praise the Lord. I saw something else in here because that phrase, it is I, it is a ghost, it, it is, comes, a, comes to mind in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 3. It says this, now the tempter came to him, that's the devil when he was tempted he said, if you be the son of God, command these stones to be bread. Jesus didn't answer him, except man does not live by bread alone. But he didn't give him an answer. He didn't, he didn't perform for the devil to prove who he was. But yet when Peter says, it is you, it was a different story. Yeah, come on. Why? Because Peter said this. He didn't say, if it is you. He said, Lord, if it's you, he did say, if it's you, but he said, if it's you, he said something else. Command me. The disciples knew when Jesus put a command out, only Jesus could do that. But when he spoke, my life changed. We can't explain how or why, but when Jesus speaks, something happened. If this really is Jesus, then Lord bid me to come. Command me. He didn't say, can I come out there and visit you? He said, no, command me to be where you're at. Amen. On that, he said, what? Why did he say that? Because basically his heart was for the will of God. Amen? To look at the ability of Jesus was different than attacking or questioning his identity. When the devil comes to you, he's not attacking your power in Christ and what you have in Christ. He's looking at your, to attack your identity. Because if you identify with Christ, he wants to ruin that identity. And therefore, uh, render you helpless. And easier to pray for him. And in that case, Jesus took the thing different. He wasn't there to prove to the devil who he was. Amen? He said, man, does not live by bread alone. No. Now, you've, you're hungry for 40 days. You've got to be hungry. I don't care. You're hungry. Yeah. Amen? The Bible says that he fasted for 40 days and then became hungry. 
I fasted for one day one time I got hungry. I was hungry the whole day. <laughs> it didn't take 40 days to get hungry. <laughs> anyway, praise the Lord. <laughs> You're back to what I'm saying. So there's a key to this. And what I saw, so the fact is, we have to determine, is it the Lord? When God speaks to us, is it him? How do we know? We have to know. We have to know it's him before we do anything. And this is where I want to tell you, this is where the message is going this morning because basically if you're looking for strength in that last mile, you're not going to find it in questioning and making God respond to your intellect. In other words, God isn't bound to you by your intellectual capacity. <laughs> or me, I'm not saying you, I'm preaching down anybody, because basically I do the same thing, amen? God says one in one day, about 33 years ago, he says, I want you to close the church down here in Boynton Beach, he says, I want you to pick up your family, he says, I want you to move to Key West. Why? Why? I didn't have any reason. I didn't, at the time, I didn't even like Key West. I had a, I had a house just off of A1A, up in uh, Deerfield Beach, Florida. I was a block from the beach. Had a brand new boat sitting in my yard. Just to tell you where my financial situation was. I had income property. I was doing pretty good. I was business, I worked construction, I was doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, money was not really a big object for me. And then he says, give it all up, put it all aside, and move to Key West. What I didn't hear, he didn't he say, well, people down there will love you and rally around you and support you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> That's a whole other story for another time. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but here we are 33 years later, and the lives in, in, from this place here going out five different continents to preach the gospel over the years, yeah. uh, for, starting Lighthouse Christian Academy, doing all these things with people we've been able to help and influence and encourage over the years. It's mind-boggling. But I didn't understand it. I did not understand why I was doing well. I was doing well as part of the church. I was, matter of fact, I was sent out by my pastor to start another church in a, in a city 15 miles away. I, was, I figured everything was going on. One day, I'm in that church that we had built, started, and all of a sudden, the, uh, just a, a wave of dissatisfaction came over me of where I was at, and I began to seek the Lord. I told my wife, I said, I'm going up to the church. I said, I don't know when I'll be back. Maybe in the morning. I said, if it takes all night, I'm going to pray. I'm going to just believe God and just trust him. I, I got to get this, this. My soul is not settled, and it should be. And that's what he told me. Next morning, a phone call. I got a phone call from a pastor friend of mine. He says, he says Kevin, I got to talk to you. He says, I'm, I'm disturbed. And uh, he, had the, he had a church in, uh, in Boca Raton. And he says, he says uh, I, heard, I went to prayer last night. <laughs> yeah, me too. This is the thing, how, how God does things. And he says, I don't know, but he says, God's telling me to go down to the Keys. He said, I think he wants you to start a church down there. I said, no, not you, me. <laughs> I could hear on the other side of the phone shouting and celebrating. <laughs> oh, thank God. Pleasure. I'm going to help you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> now we're all on board. Oh, yeah, whatever you need. Man. Let's, let's go. Let's do it today. <laughs> as long as it wasn't him. <laughs> 33 years ago. Praise the Lord. And over there's things that God has done. Why would I quit now when the last mile we can see it in sight? Yeah. Amen. What I'm seeing, what I've seen in the past couple of years, God's revelation coming, right here in this place, God's revelation coming, talking about his presence. We can't get over his presence, the presence of God. And just talking about the presence, get people in get the presence. After the service, we pray for people. Last Sunday, people are getting filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Amen. Just last Sunday. So it's no wonder we're going to get a spiritual attack come right behind that this past week for this message here. What better timing, what better place? Because basically, it isn't if you're the son of God, you are the son of God. Amen. Command me. If you're the son of God, if you're Jesus, command me to come out where you're at. Give me, give me an order that I can follow. Give me something that I can do. And I know that thing there that you call me as someone's going to do. 
the disciples didn't know a whole lot. They didn't have a lot in their understanding. Though the, Jesus said one time, he said, he said, they asked him, why do you teach in parables? And he says, <laughs> basically, he said, for, it is for you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom, but not for them. Amen. Understand? They didn't understand the mysteries of the kingdom. He's speaking. They were scratching their heads. They couldn't figure out for nothing. Do you remember the time in John chapter 6 where Jesus was preaching to about a crowd of about 15,000 people, 10,000, 15,000 people? Remember, he had just, uh, he had just taken and, and, and took the little boy's lunch and made loads of, you know, fed all the people. Well, those multitudes followed him around the Sea of Galilee and met him there. And he's preaching again. And he says, I am the bread of life. And that offended a lot of them, and some people just got offended. He said, then he said, I'm the bread of life, eat of the bread of life. That offended some more people, they walked away. And then he says, I'm the bread of life, eat of my flesh, and drink of my blood. And that took out the rest of them. Except for the 12, and he said, are you guys going to leave too? And Peter said, where else will we find the words of life? What did he do? He was saying something that was beyond their understanding. And because they could not understand it, they dismissed it. They dismissed the Savior. They dismissed the Word of God, God the Father. Now, wait a minute. Jesus said this. He said, he said that the only words I speak, he said, I speak of the Father. Amen? In John chapter 5. He says, most assuredly, he said, the Son can do nothing of himself, but he sees what the Father has done. So basically, the message that he was preaching was the Father's message. Hmm. Jesus' course on 101 on how to build churches. Offend as many people as you can. <laughs> I guess, I don't know. <laughs> I still, I'm still baffled over it. I don't understand it. But when he turned to the disciples, they didn't understand it. They're scratching their heads also. But I, I started looking at a series of these things, and maybe this is the thing we need to work on. Book of Revelation, Revelation 1, chapter 3 says this, Blessed is he who reads those, who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written. Not once in there does it say understand. Amen. Not once do we have a commandment that say understand. How many has ever picked up the Bible or anything and read a scripture, a, a verse, a scripture, and has jumped off the page at them? And, they, and you say, wow, that is great. And what does it mean? I have no idea. But it is just so great. <laughs> I mean, it's been there. Praise the Lord. What's the difference? Well, the difference is this, is there your spirit is feeding your mind instead of the other way around. But we are so accustomed to going by what our intellect says and our understanding. And in, in, in essence, what we end up doing is we end up limiting our very spiritual growth that we need. Amen? Praise the Lord. We hinder or dwarf our spiritual person until we wait to get understanding. Oh, how many times as a pastor I sit in council and say, I don't understand, pastor. I don't understand this word. I don't understand this. I said, I don't know. I don't either. <laughs> but the fact is, I know God said it. And then I started digging a little bit deeper. Because Jesus said in the book of Acts, he said, he even told his disciples in, in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, he says, he says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. He said that, then he ascended to heaven and said, go out into the world and make disciples. Wait a minute. It's not for us to know the time or season. But Jesus said, okay, this is the time and the season to go make disciples. Okay, then we do, what do we do next? Well, how do we do that? Basically, what Jesus was doing with his disciples is he was training them. Training them the whole time. Three years they went, three years of training to know how to handle things when the Holy Spirit came that was going to be unexplainable, that wasn't going to be found in the law of Moses. It was, got, it was going to be a completion thereof in superseding those, a lot of those things, and they were going to have to explain, or those, they were going to have to take it, take it to... Uh, uh, for instance, Peter walks up... I mean, the day of Pentecost, before, before the crucifixion... Let me go back even further. He was ready to deny Christ. He became a Christ denier. 
What happened to Peter from being a Christ denier to all of a sudden uh, uh, standing up and preaching on the day of Pentecost with the outpouring of the Spirit? Could anybody explain that move back then? We can't even explain it today. How you get 120 people together, they, the Holy Spirit moves, and they begin to pray in other tongues, and all these other people, because Jerusalem is an international city, it is today. Uh, in all these languages, and they understood their own language. It doesn't say, the Bible never said it was spoken. It says they understood, they heard. It doesn't say it was spoken. God was doing a miracle. And that's not what gathered them, by the way. It wasn't the speaking of language. You read it. They heard a noise, like a thunder from heaven. And what was that? And it led them over to where the upper room was. <laughs> then Peter came out and began to preach. This Christ denier began to preach. Because Jesus had appeared 40 days. This was, a, this was 10 days after Jesus' ascension. That makes 50 days where Pentecost means 50. And F Pentecost feast in the Jewish celebration is always, is always uh, 50 days after, after Passover. And this is when Jesus, it is amazing. The day of Pentecost when, when, uh, is the day they celebrate that Moses was handed the law from God. On that same day, God not only gave them the law to the, to the, to the first generation of believers, he gave them the filling of spirit on that same day to the second. Amen? Amen. So those two, those two events became magical days from heaven because basically God supernaturally descended. Amen? Well, from Jesus' time, we have, we've been walking under open heaven ever since. It never did close up. Then open open heaven. That's, an, that's another uh, whole challenging thing right there. So you see, it's different. What happened to Peter when he walks up to the temple? He's going to the temple. And remember Jesus cleaning the temp, cleansing the temple because basically anybody with a, fear, a physical affliction was not allowed in. And they weren't perfect. They weren't allowed in the temple. Jesus, but they let the cattle and everything else in there. They were selling for sacrifices and the money changers in there, but the cripples and, and people needed help. Healing could go in there. That's what it was about. Jesus went in there he, twice in the scriptures. He, he turned over the money changers' tables and kicked them all out. I'll get into that in a minute because they, they, they questioned his authority. I'll get into that next. So, so, so what's going on there? But when they were healed, they couldn't kick them back out of the temple. Peter, on the day after Pentecost, the very first miracle after the day of Pentecost, Peter walks up, he sees this lame man, he's been lame from birth, and the guy is begging. That's what his right was. That's the only way he made a living. It's what they, it, was a, it was a social security time or the <laughs> welfare uh, uh, um, thing of the day, I guess. So he, had a, they, he was allowed to beg at the temple steps. And people were commanded under the law of Moses to take care of these people, and they would give them money and so on and so forth. Peter walks up and says, silver and gold, I have none. But he said, well, I give you. I give you in the name of Jesus. And he stretched forth his right hand. Very significant. I don't have time to teach it, but it's very significant. The right hand is a stronger blessing than the left hand. We know that from the cross handed blessing of Jacob and so on and so forth. Stretched forth his right hand, and the man automatically began to walk. Never walked in his entire life. What did he do? He went leaping and rejoicing into the temple because they couldn't throw him out. He was whole. He was whole. And that was in the face of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of them. They were in the face of those guys. They could not throw him out because he now was whole. He couldn't go in before. Now we can go in. Remember I taught, uh, was it a couple weeks ago? Was it, last, was it last week? What did I think? I thought, anyway, I taught on the gates. A gate is a, uh, 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 Jacob, when I talk on Jacob, uh, Genesis chapter 28, remember that? And, and, and uh, what Jacob said, he says, he saw the vision of a ladder going up and down heaven. And he said, this, truly, he said, this is, the, this is the, the house of God, the gate of heaven. That was, that was the scripture, that's what the, the, was the quote he did. And of course, he built the whole thing there. But what he was saying, he was saying, he said, the church was the gate of heaven. This is what they believed at the time the temple was, the gate of heaven. So basically, what is a gate? A gate is a passageway from one reality to another reality. We live in one reality, but our heart is in another reality. Amen? Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's get a little sidetracked here, but uh, this one will give you the, the idea. The whole thing is, it says the the, the, the word of God has the power within itself. Amen? Let me give you that, let me give you that scripture. Um, I've got about five pages of notes that I left over from last week. <laughs> and, uh, 
But I'll, <coughs> I wrote down a one scripture or whatever. Uh, it was good, too. Praise the Lord. Three in my notes. Give me a second. Right here. Oh, anyway, I'm going right past it. Here's it right here. Luke chapter 1, verse 37. I, I, I should remember the story anyway. Luke chapter 1, verse 37. Remember the, uh, the angel comes to Mary and she's announcing the birth of Christ. Makes this statement. This is very interesting because basically what he said, this is about the word of God. Luke chapter 7, verse, uh, Luke 1, verse 37. Uh, for God, it says this. It says, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Nothing will be impossible. In the Greek, when you break this down in, in the Greek knowledge, nothing is actually two words. Not just one word, two words. And what the word nothing means, it says no, is, is one Greek word, means no, rhema. The word rhema in the Bible, the Greek word, is a spoken word. Logos is a written word, which you find, so there's two words in the Greek for word, the word word. <laughs> but one is for the spoken word. So what he's saying in Luke chapter 1, verse 37, he says, he says, for God, no rhema, okay, will be impossible. Okay, no rhema will be impossible. Uh, uh, so, so basically, with God, no rhema will be impossible. He's saying this, he's saying, he said, it will not be impossible. The word impossible is to have no strength or power. So it says, it, it, this is the whole encapsulation. God's spoken word contains within in it, the power to change and transform. He didn't say the understanding of God's word, but he said the speaking of God's word. When we pick up the Bible, the Logos, and we read it, we want God to speak to us through that word. And that word has the power within itself to save. Amen. That's what I want to get across. Praise the Lord. Has the power within itself. So that when we hear the word, this is why I said we're waiting for understanding, but you don't have to. All you have to do is receive it as the word of God. God will bring you not just understanding, but revelation, but it will be his bringing to it. But if we're waiting for understanding, what we're, abs as, as such, uh, what we're actually doing is we're letting our mind feed our spirit instead of our spirit feeding our mind. Amen. And it hinders and dwarfs our spiritual growth, which I mentioned before. And this is the important point I want to bring across because we're talking about the last mile. I don't care how many years you've been a Christian or how many years you've been preaching for that matter or, or a pastor, how many years you've done anything. You can total up all your years and to God it's just a blink. <laughs> it's nothing, amen, for, for him. It's, it is to us. It seems bigger for us. But when his spoken word speaks, so when, let me get back to, to, to Peter again sitting on, on water. When Jesus said, come, was that the spoken word? Did Peter have an understanding of water dynamics? Did he have a degree in physics that this will not work? Did he try to reason, does this make any sense to you? Why would I get up? Anybody could have said that. Now, the first thing they mentioned was, is it a ghost? Because they believed in that time that, that, there was, that there were spirits that posed as people and they would come out on the water, especially during a storm. Fishermen's, uh, uh, you can call it whatever you want. So they weren't sure if this thing is real or not. Peter said, if it be you, bid me to come. And Jesus said, come. Peter walked out of the boat. Now, I hear people make, some people make fun of this. He's making, well, yeah, he, took, he thinks he can walk out of water, took three steps and, and, and sunk. No, wait a minute. That's not what it says. It says he walked, and immediately, immediately, when he began to sink, Jesus picked him up. He was almost there. He was almost there. Jesus didn't move. He says, come. In other words, Peter, you come to me. Give the word. So the word of God went forth, and the word of God suspended him for a distance. We don't know how long that distance was, but we do know this. He looked at the wind and the waves and became afraid. And as soon as he became afraid, he sunk, and Jesus immediately stretched down and picked him up. He had to be almost there because Jesus couldn't immediately pick down, pick him up. So he walked further than what people want to credit him for. Now, I would have said, man, I would have gone back to that boat and said, 
You guys top that one. <laughs> uh-huh, yeah. Who's got faith now, huh? Jesus didn't do that. He says, where did you doubt? What, in other words, what is wrong with you? You had it in the palm of your hand. I'd given you the palm, a miracle, the palm of your hand, and you did what? You swapped it for fear? Where does fear come from? The understanding, our intellect, but not our spirit. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. <laughs> Are you here this morning? <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's what he's trying to bring across. And that's what I was seeing. I said, man, I said, you know, I would have given the guy a gold star anyway. At least he walked further than them other guys. But you understand something. You can look around and say, well, I'm a better Christian than that person. No. The Bible says you don't compare yourself amongst yourself because God is dealing with everybody on an individual basis. You know, Jesus didn't go back to the boat and rebuke those other ones for not trying. Did he? No, they were just boat sitters. You got some that are water walkers, you got some that are boat sitters. But no, he rebuked Peter for not finishing. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> I know, that's what I said too. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I go back to another thing. It's going to sound like it's out of context, but I, I put it together on, on purpose. I wanted, wanted to do this. And um, I was reading this one day, and it came that He said, in Ma Matthew chapter 21, you can turn there if you want to, in verse 23 and 27 is what I'm going to make my reference to. It's, I put in my notes, the authority of Christ being challenged. I want to cover this because this is, this is, this is something that might bring to light. It says now, in verse 23, it says, Now when, G when he came, talking about Jesus, came to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him and, uh, as he was teaching and said, But what authority do you do these things? What did he just do? Well, he just did miracles. Blind eyes opened, deaf ears healed, you know, lame walked, all these miracles. So they had questioned, he said, But what authority do you do these things? And, he, and who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered them, uh, answered them and said this. He said, I also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I'll likewise uh, tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. This is Jesus' question. The baptism of John, where is it from? Is it from heaven or from men? Interesting question. They reason with themselves because they say they reason amongst themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, uh, uh, why then didn't we not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. Mm -hmm. So they answered Jesus and said, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I brought them. So the idea that Jesus answers every question, I can prove he doesn't. But with two things going on there, there's two, two things happening here. Because Jesus said this in Mark chapter 8. He said, he told his disciples, he says, take heed, in other words, take warning. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Two things, Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. He said, beware of those leavens. Now, leaven is something you put in bread, the yeast makes it rise, correct? Okay. Uh, what it was a symbol of, it was a symbol of sin in, the, in, in us. Jesus, we, we have communion, we have communion with matzah that has no leaven in it, because it represents Jesus' body, and Jesus' body had no sin. Okay, so that's what leaven was, was considered sin. But he mentioned two leavens. <laughs> I remember he said this, he said, and, and the guys were saying, oh, man, we forgot lunch, didn't we? You know, he's mentioning bread. Oh, come on. listen up, guys. He said, no, he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Leaven, in this sense that he's talking about, is a mindset. It's a mindset. It's a way of thinking. It's a thought process. He said, beware of the thought process. Let me put a thought process. Beware of the thought process of the Pharisees. That's who was just challenging him. And beware of the thought process, uh, th thought process of Herod. That's political. You have two entities here that Jesus said, be, care be careful of the mindset of these two things. Hmm. Political and religious. He said, beware of those two mindsets. Why? Because those two mindsets go according to only understanding nothing else. 
In other words, they can't accept what they do not understand. In religion, miracles that Jesus told us to seek after, go after, lay hands on, and, 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 and produce cannot be done in religion because religion doesn't if, doesn't, if it doesn't happen, then they have to reason why it doesn't. To satisfy their own mindset and reasoning, they basically dismiss it. It's not for today. It died out with the last apostle. But Jesus, you'll never, you'll never find a scripture that way that says that. Jesus said, go out and lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. He said, he said lay hands on the you may stink at it. <laughs> it may not work for you. It doesn't give you the right to cancel the assignment. Yeah. We have an assignment for the Lord to do these things. Yes. So what do we do? Well, what we do here, we practice so we get better at it. Amen. If I pray and don't get answered prayer, I pray harder. Then I'll put a little fasting with that prayer. I'll get close to the Spirit. I'll ask God for direction. Amen. But one thing you do not do is dismiss the Scripture, what it says. Uh-uh. Praise the Lord. Why? Because we've read and studied this even this morning that the power of God's word has the power to save. It doesn't, they, who was ever saved on their understanding? The things that I, I was brought up in church all my life, but it wasn't until 1976 that I got saved. And then it wasn't until 1981 I got filled with the spirit. How come it took me so long? I don't know. Hung around the wrong people. <laughs> sometimes the right people, sometimes the wrong people. But praise the Lord, whatever influence. Why? I took on the leaven of the Pharisees and took on the leaven of Herod. Amen? You can hear the leaven of Herod, uh, Herod every night. Just turn on the 5 o'clock news and you'll hear all kinds of things. Amen? Of people telling you whatever you want to hear to get a vote. Yeah, I'm not going to get political, but I mean, that's, that's what it is. Jesus said, beware of that when it comes to your life and begins to affect you. Because whatever happens in the world, what I said before, whatever happens in the world, what God is doing is more important and has more authority. Some people look at the devil as, well, he's, less, uh, he's, he's the evil part of God. No, he's not. Understand what he is. He's a fallen angel. He, he's not even in the same category as the Father. Not even in the same room. <laughs> he tried to sneak in the room one time and was kicked out <laughs> after, his, after the first time he rebelled he was thrown out Jesus said I saw him fall from heaven like lightning <laughs> how fast, that's how fast he was excommunicated <laughs> no he's not even in the same class the only authority he has is what he's manipulated from Adam but Jesus brought, us, brought back for us praise the Lord help anybody this morning so to get back to my original question, how do we strengthen ourselves in the last, in the last mile, the last mile, that we're, the last stretch? How do we strengthen ourselves in that? Where, however long that is, wherever that is. How do we strengthen ourselves? Because we, I know this for years and years of ministry. It is easy to get burned out. It is easy to get discouraged. It is easy to say, well, I got salvation, but I don't need church anymore. Easy to say that. Especially when you have a whole generation, another younger generation, that was never brought up in church. They see no need for it all. Jesus said, he said, this is, his, he said, uh, Paul writes it in, in Scripture. I mean, believe Scripture is the Word of God. Okay, this is where I come from. But the fact is, he says, he says you know, to assemble ourselves together. An assembly is for a purpose. A gathering is for a group. Jesus will show up at a group, gathering for whatever purpose, as long as it's in his name. Amen. But an assembly has a purpose and, a, and a, 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 a spiritual significance to an assembly. Paul said, don't forget, forsake the assembling together of yourselves. Do you know when he said that, the average person could be killed for going to church? What we call going to church. Because they, were, they, they were being perse persecuted so badly that they could be killed. Paul said, don't forsake it anyway. It's still worth it. That's how serious it was to the Father, how serious it was to God. Not, not a religious gathering. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about we come together as a church and begin to encourage one another in the Lord and help their spiritual growth. Knowing that the spoken word of God, if I read the spoken word, right out, just read it out of here, it can change somebody's life for the better. Help anybody? Wow. Amen. I get 29 seconds for an amen. Amen.
<laughs> Always want to do that. Praise the Lord. Anyway. <laughs> Amen. But uh, I, no, I'm, I'll, I'll leave this. I'll leave that for next week. Praise the Lord. I got I got more stuff than I could possibly preach. Let's walk away with some things. The fact is, this is the thing. Don't let the devil attack your identity. Your identity is found in Christ. I'll boil it all down in the, in the time I don't have left. <laughs> but our identity. Don't let the devil attack your identity. Jesus didn't. Amen? Another thing is this. He said, listen to the word. Because listening to the word can change and transform things. Amen? Listen to the word. And let God, let God speak into you. Get understanding later. Now, I'm not saying this, we're against understanding by no means. We're not a bunch of just mindless idiots. No, we get understanding. But the fact is, what I'm talking about is a person, they won't move until they understand. I have watched scores of people that were called to ministry, had the gifting and the anointing of God, never would because they couldn't understand it and make it understand financially. Amen? They wouldn't do it. I knew others that said, this is God. This is definitely God. And when they got out, other ministers, when they got out, didn't get the money or the people they thought they would get and quit, well, I guess it wasn't God, and walk away as God was only interested in the money or people. Understand something. Uh, this is where I come from. This is my way. Understand something. Right here in the town we live in, everybody in this room that's a believer has surrounding them a power that can push back the forces of darkness, amen, to the degree of a thousand. When we get two people together, we, go, we have a power within us that pushes back the powers of darkness to 10,000. I like God's math. Amen? That's the difference. But when Paul said, when the end times came, they gathered and they had a form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. And he says, from such, stay away. Amen? Amen? From such, stay away, he told Timothy. Another letter he wrote in prison. <laughs> but, uh, but, but he said, no, from such, stay away. He said, have a form of godliness. We do all the nice religious things, but deny the power that, of God. That power is what changes and transforms people. Power is what changes lives. Power is what, what speaks to us. And God's word itself has the power in that. Amen? Amen? So when we take and only, only filter out the scriptures, I like the scriptures that hit you right in the head. I like the scriptures that will kick you in the head. Sometimes, you know, Irish, stubborn, I need some of that sometimes. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but uh, anything that can, you know, to conform the way God wants me to conform. I don't want to be conformed to the way of the world. I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. How does the mind get renewed? Let me review. The spirit takes in the word of God and it feeds the mind. The mind will get an understanding as we go. Amen? Through the whole process, strengthening will come. I got I got to stop. I'm out of time. Praise the Lord. So uh, I'll pick this up today. Next week. Praise the Lord. Help anybody this morning. Let's stand to our feet. Amen. Glory be to God. Praise the Lord. If you're in here this morning, and you stumbled in here somehow, or somebody pushed you in here, drugged you in here, or they they um, it, you thought you were someplace else, and they you thought this is not Pepsi. Um, but anyway, if you don't identify with Christ, you never give your heart to the Lord. Please let us pray with you. Amen. Anybody in here? We want to, we want to help you out this morning uh, in, 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 that, in that process because it's a life-changing process that you would not believe. It's, it's, it's amazing. If we can focus off the leaven of the Pharisees because basically the leaven of the Pharisees has another characteristic that I don't have time to get to in my message but it has another characteristic to it. It looks at everything in a negative. God can do nothing. It's a powerless God and it looks at everything in a negative. That's the leaven of the Pharisees. That mindset needs to be uprooted and thrown out. Amen? Help me by, <laughs> I gotta stop. I'm gonna get preaching mode over here next Tuesday. Father, we just pray this morning in the name of Jesus. If anybody here needs the Lord, 
believe in salvation, need the Lord, raise your hand right now. I'll acknowledge you and we'll pray for you afterwards. Okay, good. Everybody here saved? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. By the way, when I close out this prayer and Jim takes me off the live stream, he said, anything uh, you need prayer for, come on up here. Our leadership will pray for you. Anything at all, whatever you need, we'll come in agreement with you. We'll lay hands on you. Whatever you need for prayer, we want to get that need met this morning so you don't go out of church the same way you come in. <laughs> Unless you came in perfect. <laughs> Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. We put your blessing upon these people now. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to share your word this morning. Thank you, Lord. And Father, I pray that it's not so much that was said, but what is heard by the individual, that they need to, to heal a heart, that will change and transform their life, that will bring a, a sense <laughs> to something that means, means unsensible sometimes, that that's a word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you praise this morning. We thank you, Lord. And we thank you as we close out this service and we begin to pray for people. I pray your presence and anointing to change and transform every life in here this morning by something that was said by the word of God this morning. In Jesus' name, we give you praise. We thank you, Lord. You are our healer, our baptizer, the glory and the lifter of our head. And, for you, and to you and to you alone, we give praise for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen.